Okay, good. I'm okay. recording. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, we are here to introduce to you our product, Loop, and we are very excited to be sharing our Loop preview with you today, and we want to thank you for taking the time out to join us on our introductory webinar. Over the next hour, we are going to be showing you just some of the ways that we think that Loop can help to magnify the issues that really matter, not just to your logging guy, but to your entire development team. In a moment, I am going to hand you over to your glamorous presenters for the evening. But firstly, I wanted to draw your attention to the chat window in your GoToWebinar admin panel. If you have a question during the webinar, please do type it into that window. This is an interactive webinar, so if you have a question about the demonstration that you're seeing, we will have Kendall and Gary try to answer those questions as we go. But if your question is better dealt with outside of the presentation, or you would prefer to contact us offline, um, you can contact us via email at support at gibraltarsoftware.com, and we will get back to you via email or we will try to post a quick reply to you in the chat window, so keep an eye out for our replies. And now, the highlight of this evening, I would like to introduce you to our Gibraltar software founder and development lead, Kendall Miller, and to our company evangelist, Gary Short. Gentlemen, this is your shining moment. It is over to you. Okay, hello everybody. Um, hopefully you can see my screen. Um, Kendall, are you are you there? Kendall, can anybody hear me? I can hear you. Yay! <clears throat> Yeah. Hi, Gary. I believe Kendall's having some problems with the uh, audio side. We're seeing if we can work those out. All right. Um, yeah, I'm not entirely sure what happened. There was a, I had a bit of problem um, actually sharing my screen there, taking um, the, the presenter screen. It took a couple of seconds to um, sort out. That's what that delay was about. So maybe Kendall's having the same kind of issues with sound. Um, I'll, I'll just give him a couple of minutes to see if he can get that sorted out. and. Um, if if not, perhaps you can you can play Kendall for the uh, rest of the evening, or maybe Rachel would like to play Kendall. I don't have a deep enough voice to play Kendall. Oh, I'm sure you can Sorry. manage. Okay. Sorry, everybody. Kendall's having a few problems, so hopefully we'll get started soon. So, am I on it now? Yay! God bless. So, I really apologize for that, people. It's always, um, always a little bit of a. Te you never know which direction the technical glitch is going to come from, and let's hope that that is all there is, and so I, we don't have any more wasting of time. So, I apologize for that. Let me get this off by talking about um, why have we gone ahead and renamed our flagship Gibraltar product Loop. Um, so as some of you may know, we've had the product Gibraltar in the market now for several years. And as we were getting ready for this new release and looking around, we realized that we have gone uh, a lot farther down the road from what we originally established the, um, uh, as the vision uh, for Gibraltar. And the name itself no longer really was sufficiently evocative of the direction of the product. Where we're really going is to this vision now of DevOps. 
combined uh, capabilities between developers and operations teams, because in the end, where Gibraltar's always been focused was delivering value uh, with your software in the field. That's, uh, that aspect of being in the field has always been essential to, to what we've wanted to do. And that fits with this growing movement of DevOps. And along the way, we've decided that we needed to, um, we, we want to give people a clearer vision of that, have a name that evokes that a little better, and really fits with the uh, vision of both being wide, uh, something that's accessible to many people, and yet can still do the deep drill down that Gibraltar's always been known for, uh, all the way down into you know individual items and individual uh, issues. So what you're going to see today really is the culmination of about a year and a half's work of getting going um, of the, a new web UI, but that's really just the tip of the iceberg that fits into this whole product vision for Loop. And um, with that, then I'm going to pass it back to Gary. And Gary, why don't you w walk through a bit of what the dev team was really trying to do when they created the web UI that you're going to demonstrate today? Yeah, sure. Well, following on from what you were saying there, um, Kendall, um, by creating a web UI, what the development team were trying to do was to broaden the appeal of the um, of what was um, Gibraltar Analyst. Um, broaden that appeal out to the team as a whole. Um, Gibraltar Analyst was, um, or and still is in fact, a, a desktop application which gets in, installed on um, a team member's desktop. And traditionally that chap um, would then become the login guy. And instead of everybody having access and knowing how to explore around the rich vein of information that um, Gibraltar Analyst or Loop, as, as it's going to be called now, could actually provide. And what would happen is you would end up having a login guy, and everybody would go to that guy and and ask for information, and then they would get information in in um, in bit format, um, just as and when they they actually required it. The um, idea behind Loop is to broaden that appeal out to everybody in the team, so that everybody in the team knows how to use Loop and how to um, get access to that information. Um, and so it's something that's going to try and combine the depth of information given by analysts and also um, broaden that out to the entire team. Now, the Gibraltar Analyst product, that's still going to be available, right? That's still part of what we're up to? Oh, totally. Yes, if, um, if people still want to, um, if they still want analyst, if um, analyst provides a very deep and very rich vein of information. Um, so if you imagine... Um, analyst as being narrow and deep, whereas Loop tries to be as deep but is much broader, um, then really you pick which scenario you, you want to go for. Um, if you have a setup where you only really need one guy in your team to be able to do this kind of thing, then absolutely, um, analysts will still be around, still be available for you. So, and now what we've done is we've renamed that to a Loop Desktop, right? So it all fits into the same family. So we have Loop Server and Loop Desktop. And Loop Desktop is still there to do that deep dive, but we've, we've added to it. So, and, and there's actually a number of improvements uh, to uh, Loop Desktop, which we're not going to get into today, right? That's a whole separate webinar. Um, I'm sorry, um, Kendall, you kind of broke up there towards the end. I think um, you kind of sounded a bit like a Dalek. I kind of missed that last bit of what you were saying. I'm sorry. That's fine, that's Gary. So what I was mentioning to folks is that we're not going to get into the improvements on the desktop side today. Um, we're going to focus in strictly on the, the new, the brand new web interface that's part of Loop. Yes, that's absolutely right. Um, we'll, we'll keep the improvements for the desktop Loop um, for another day and just introduce um, the, the brand new uh, Loop for web today. Great. Okay, so let's, if we're talking about it broadening out uh, and, and giving access to, for a lot of people to the information, uh, let's, let's look at it from a, different, a couple different perspectives. Let's start with, uh, say, I'm a product manager, right? I'm responsible for an application. So walk me through how this new tool really works for me as the guy uh, who's responsible for a product. Okay, so if you're the guy who's responsible for a product, um, for, first of all, let's just talk a little bit about what you're going to see when you first log in to Loop for the Web. You're going to get this desktop um, view here that you are uh, looking at at the minute. And um, what you'll see down the left-hand side is a list of applications that Loop for the Web is actually monitoring at the moment. Um, also, you will see if you've favorited those um, 
or one or more of those applications, then you'll get this kind of badge formation um, up here at the top. And in the badge, you'll see summary information of how your application is actually behaving at this time. Now, for the purposes of this webinar, I've created this Acme Software test application, and that's what we'll be using for part of um, this session um, just now. So as a product manager, you're going to be responsible, or one of the things you're going to be responsible for is the overall quality of the product. Um, with that in mind, um, if we jump into here, um, if we have a look, for example, under new events, you can get a kind of at-a-glance view of the quality of your um, application out there in the wild. And the events you're going to see here in terms of triage, and, and this is the list that you'd use to, to triage um, issues that you were having, so in terms of that, you'll see three kinds of um, events coming up, or not necessarily three kinds of events, but three ways that you're going to deal with um, those events. And we'll take a look at each of those in turn now. So down here, we can see the, the first one we're going to deal with. Um, we, we've got an error here, and it says, I cannot reach the home server. And, and here, we are, um, we're kind of modeling a scenario where and we've got a piece of software out there in the wild, and every time that software is used, it phones home to update or to find some other piece, piece of information. And at the minute, we know that uh, the server that responds to that is actually down for maintenance, and it's going to be down for maintenance for the next 24 to 48 hours. So for the next 40 hours, we're not really going to be interested in this error, but we are going to be interested in it subsequently because we want to trap any errors um, against that server once we know that it's up and running. So here what we would do is we would suppress that um, error for the moment. So if we just select that there, and down here in the, up on the buttons we press, we um, click on suppress, then that particular error message is going to be suppressed um, until we unsuppress it, i.e. after the 40 hours is finished and our server is back up and running. And to unsuppress it, we just click here into suppressed events. We can find that um, we can find that same error there. We can select it, um, and we can press the unsuppress button down here, and it will go back into the uh, into the list. So that's the first one. <clears throat> the second one that we're going to um, going to deal with is this um, error message here, which says upload interrupted. And the scenario we're modeling here is where we have something which we believe to be some kind of transient internet connectivity issue. We look at this and a file upload from one of our applications was actually interrupted because they lost connectivity. Now on the surface that seems to be a fairly transient thing and so we can ignore that. And what I'm going to do here is select that and down here and I'll click ignore. Now what that means is um, we believe it's going to be transient conditions, so we've we've clicked on ignore, and what that what that means is that it's going to be ignored this time. Um, and so if it happens again, i.e. it's not transient, it's going to happen a second in the subsequent time, then that's going to come straight back and we'll see that error coming back again um, without us having to suppress or unsuppress anything. So we believe it's transient, we've hit ignore. If it happens again, we're going to see it, and we can we can um, dive into that a bit further if it turns out not to be transient. And the last one is the one we've we've left here, where we've got unknown table name order, and, and this definitely looks like some kind of an issue that we we want to explore. So we're going to go ahead and click in there, and if we actually follow up and and um, jump into that actually event details here, we can we can see a rich vein of information that um, Loop can actually provide for us. So um, for a start here, we can we can see what the actual caption is again. We can see how many occurrences that we've had, um, how many sessions it's happened in, and, and um, how many endpoints it's happened in. Obviously, because this is demonstration, um, demonstration data that I've created here, it's only happened one time in one session on my machine. But you can imagine if you, um, if you had release this software out to the wild, these numbers could be quite a lot higher. We'll also find out when it was last seen and when it was first seen, and which version it was first seen and last seen in. As we drill down a bit further, we can we find out um, the method and, uh, and the endpoint that it actually happened in, and a bit of information down here at the bottom regarding um, the machine that it, that it actually happened in. We can actually click further along here and we can look at the um, log events. 
Um, and if we click in here, we can see um, the, the same kind of information that we that we had um, before with regard to time and, and date and uh, and that kind of thing. Um, following up, if we just go back here, if we jump into um, statistics now, again, you can imagine that if you are dealing with released software with an awful lot more um, with a lot, an awful lot more users and an awful lot more information, you can see that this graph and um, this grid um, can can convey an awful lot more information to you. But we can see the um, the um, sessions by version here, and we can see this is the version number of the piece of software that actually has the issue. We can see the endpoint information um, when we um, when this issue first came um, along. We can see messages. Um, and how critical um, this is. This is really enough information um, to allow us to ascertain that this actually is an error that we want somebody to investigate. So as a product manager, once I've had a quick look through all the information that's available to me through Loop, um, I can make a decision that this is something that I want investigated and something that I want fixed. So right here at, um, at the top here, I can create an issue with this. So if I go ahead and click here create an issue. Then I get this nice little dialog that comes up um, with the caption. I can I can change these. I'll just assign it to myself uh, and I'll go ahead and create that issue. Um, once I click on there, you can see this line here updates. I've got an issue number um, 80 um, and the um, caption here of that issue. So that's now um, gone into the issue resolution workflow and at some point a developer will have a look at that and um, go ahead and uh, and fix that for us. So, so basically, so as, that's a basically manager, as, as a product manager what I can now do then is I, that new events list, I think we've now gone through all of them, that's like you said that's my triage list. I can look at things there, there are things then that I haven't decided what to do with yet. And I might, I might decide I don't know. That's what your ignore example was, or like a transient problem, or something I, I believe I know is not an issue. That's what, that was our suppressed example. Or I want someone to drill into it more. So basically, as, as a product manager, if that list is clean, I know I've addressed all of the, uh, all the items that are coming up in the field with my application. Uh, yes, that's that's absolutely right. So you can go through there and then try as that list. And now, if you see, if I jump back here, you can see um, we've suppressed the things that we don't want to see for a for a while. Ignored the stuff um, that we need to, and dealt with the stuff that we need to. And when this event, as you can see, this list is now it's now empty. So we are fairly confident that everything that's going on with our software in the world has been dealt with at least in one of the three ways that that we can. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So, uh, so I've I've been able to do that. Now, I notice that there's some other items there uh, on that list that we can look at um, that might be of interest to me as a product manager. Like, what are the most important? Like, what are the most active things going on? Um, and uh, and what's what's a set of known items? So I can see we've got a top issues and a and an open issues um, at list there. So that gives me some insight across the fleet of items. Now, of course, with your sample data, I, I'm guessing there's not a lot of difference between most frequent and most widespread, right? Because your laptop only gets around so much. Right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely right. But you can see there, you know, you can imagine that um, if this was, you know, out there in the wild and there was, you know, thousands of, of users, the difference between um, most frequent um, and most widespread, obviously, would, there'd, there'd be quite a difference there. Um, right. Right, because what we're seeing here, like on, just on this grid, we can see that this is sorting by number of endpoints, which would be computers, but we also can see right on there the sessions and occurrences, so I can pick which way is the most, uh, most important to me in deciding priority, and then know those, this is the issues that we really should be worried about the most right now. Yeah, that's so absolutely that, that's right. That's really good guidance information for me in terms of prioritizing, because of course we all know there's things go wrong in the field, and the question is, how do you prioritize that work? And, and, and get at your team, when should you have them not be doing other things so that they're addressing uh, uh, field production issues? So. Yeah, that's absolutely right. It's, um, and, and you can make that, you can make that decision as the product manager. You know, I, as, am I going to have them, am I going to have them fix the bug which happens most often or am I going to 
am I going to have them fix the bug which happens to most people? Um, mm -hmm. Those two things not necessarily being the same, of course. Cool. Great. Okay, so you've assigned something to a, t a single developer, right? So you, you create this new problem, you assign it off to somebody. What's their experience like? Because we talked about not wanting to have the, um, just have the logging guy, right? So this may be somebody who rarely comes into the application or only comes in when something gets assigned to them. What's, what's their experience look like in trying to resolve that issue? Well, right now, again, if we jump, if we jump back here um, to the dashboard, um, which is where they, where they will... Um, where they will log into, what they will see. And they've got two ways of getting into that. They can they can follow the same navigation as we had before. They can go into the issues and then click on my issues. But right here is a little helper down here um, on the right hand side here at the bottom with the my issues. If we click on that, and this is going to open up here, it'll give you a list here of all the issues which are open um, which are open to myself at the moment. And here, and if you recall, this was um, this was issue 80. This is right at the top of our list. So we can click on that, and that will take us straight into the um, issue, and it will, um, <clears throat> excuse me, it will actually update it, um, take us right into the issue with um, all the details here. So again, you can see straight away there's a, a rich vein of information provided here um, by a loop. So it tells you the number of sessions, the endpoints, um, when it was last seen and first seen and the version that it was first seen in and the version that it was last seen in, as well as um, the fact that it's assigned to me when it was created, when it was last updated. We can see lots of summary information here, again, with regards to the machine that it was on um, and that sort of thing. Now, along here as well, we'll see some session events. Um, again, I've um, covered these um, these before if we can drill in here into um, the the log events and all this kind of stuff. Um, of course, now I'm the developer fixing it, right? So I'm absolutely so deeper. exactly. So I want to be able to drill in um, because I'm whereas the, the program manager really just needed enough information um, to actually ascertain if it was a problem that he was interested in, which required to be fixed. Um, as the developer who's going to be fixing this, then obviously I need I need a a richer vein of information. So here I've drilled into the log event and I've drilled into the exception and I can actually use this now to um, um, actually draw that into the stack and um, see what information um, I've actually got here so I can see inside the main we're, we're, we're doing a search and then inside um, um, Microsoft SQL search and generics uh, inside SQL generic search and inside a search I can see exactly where the problem is so I've got a good I've got a good sense of the information here that I need to actually go ahead and um, work out pretty much um, where that uh, and where that error is occurring certainly um, a, a great starting point for going in and, uh, and debugging and, and having a look also if we just click back in here you can see also the, the statistics um, that were there um, previously. Um, I can look at the same kind of thing um, here when I'm, when I'm actually, as a developer, going in to sort this kind of thing out. Um, you can see, obviously, again, if there were more users with more machines, these graphs would be, um, would be far more rich with information. But you can see that, again, I can look at the statistics and, and that kind of, of um, information. So if I click back here in the detail, what I, what I want to do now is I want to go ahead and um, resolve this issue. So I'm going to do that very um, simply and straightforward once I can get my machine um, to behave itself. And what I'm going to do now is I want to fix that um, error. So I'm simulating fixing this error just here by um, commenting out the part that actually throws that exception. Uh, if only well, all errors were that. That's a great fix. Yeah, that's a brilliant fix, isn't it? It's, if only all errors were uh, yeah. at least fixed. So if I run this again now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a different version created when I when I run this. And obviously, there's no there's no issue in that particular there's no issue with this particular version. So if I go ahead now and jump back in here, um, I fix the issue. So what I want to do now is I want to go ahead and resolve it. So I click on the resolve button here. Um, it was last seen in this version ending uh, 194, so I can go ahead and um, mark that as being fixed once I've done all my tests and everything with that version that we've just created. And um, 
I can um, hit that resolve button and you'll see um, that um, the information has now been updated and it tells us which version it was fixed in and you can see up here as well that this issue has now become resolved and that's great and everything is fine and that's fixed and we can all go um, on our way rejoicing but what happens if we accidentally reintroduce that um, same bug in a, in a later edition? Well, we can actually um, we can actually take a look at what is happen, um, what would happen at the end of that, that scenario if we just go back and uh, comment that out, uh, sorry, um, take off the comment and reintroduce that bug. If we can run this again, and then we go back into our um, and go back into our, our issues here. We can see that if we go back into this this um, this issue, it's now back to being active again. Now we didn't have to go through that whole um, workflow with the the product manager having to spot the issue and um, go through the same triage principles before, what's happened there is Loop has spotted this, Loop has spotted the actual exception, it's recognized that as an exception that it's seen before, it also realizes that there was an issue raised on that exception, it's gone and found that issue and it's um, reactivated that issue. So now we can also see that the information here has been updated to say um, it was first seen in this issue here ending 194 but it was last seen in this version here ending 885 so um, that's kind of again really useful information that will provide for you that's um, helping you through the triage process and um, reactivating issues back to the, the person, the developer who, de who dealt with it in the first instance if um, bugs are reintroduced in future versions and of course that's really useful because the developer who dealt with this in the first instance is, is going to know exactly how to fix this issue and then can can help the DevOps guy guys and um, work out why that particular bug was reintroduced in future versions. So that's a quick tour there of how Loop really helps the um, really helps the, the, the dev guy sort out issues and bugs in applications. That's great. So um, I appreciate that, and I can see it looks to me like you're using the built-in Visual Studio Auto version numbering, and so that's how come every time you do a build, right, you're getting a, a new version. And so as long as those version numbers are incrementing, it it it's able to do the process you just saw, where it recognizes you said it was fixed in version one, it comes back in version two. Uh, therefore, uh, that you, you must not have fixed it, or it must have been reintroduced. Uh, yeah, that's that, that's great. That's absolutely right. I mean, you're absolutely right there. I mean, I said it was um, it was reintroduced, but you're you're right in as much as that it, that's not necessarily true. It doesn't necessarily have to be reintroduced. It could just be um, you fixed it, and the tests that you ran looked like it fixed the problem. But when it went out there in the wild, um, you know, your your test cases didn't cover all scenarios, and of course, you hadn't actually fixed it um, properly um, in the first instance. No, that's that crazy little uh, issue of it actually has to be fixed in the wild, not just fixed on a my machine. I, I, oh, I hate that. Yeah, it's, so, it's terrible. If everybody if everybody just used my machine, um, then it, it well, would work fine. <laughs> then we get a lot more endpoint traffic here because your machine would be everywhere. Um, <laughs> my machine would be everywhere. We had two great absolutely. questions that uh, we had two great questions that got raised uh, while we were going through that, and I just want to duck back and and cover them. One thing that's really really good to know is we're not showing it in today's build. But yes, we do have defect tracking integration. And in fact, we, we ship in the box with integration for Fog Bug and Countersoft's Gemini product. And that's going to continue forward. And what that would mean is, is that when an issue gets opened, if you have that mapped across to the other system, it will open a defect in your other system. And uh, if you resolve it in the other system, it will be resolved in loop. Um, so the two, and, and if it reopens it in loop, it will reopen it in the defect tracking system. This is an extension of what we do already automatically due to a point uh, in the in the in the previous versions of the application the big difference we're really doing two things here one is is that um, we're not having to push all the information to the defect tracking system so you don't have to if you've looked at the, the integration we've done previously with uh, fog bugs and Gemini we have to put a lot of information into those systems to replicate some of these kind of views um, and they just they're not meant to track this type of information all the time and so it gets very clunky 
Um, the other thing is that we also found out in surveys, talking with a lot of folks, that there's a lot of times they don't necessarily want to open things up in the defect tracking system. It may be that only some apps do they want to wrap the defect tracking system, or they have different teams and therefore have different ways they want to work with things. Or, frankly, a lot of teams don't actually have uh, a formal defect tracking system that they're using, you know, like a fog bugs or something like that. And we wanted to make sure that each of those folks had an option that covered them. Um, that extensibility, by the way, I said we shipped two in the box. We are going to be coming out with some more uh, for that based on what people request from us. And um, uh, we also, that's all done through our add-in API. So we have also had customers that have integrated with their own defect tracking system of choice without actually any of our assistance because it's all using the public documented APIs uh, in the product. So I, I really appreciate the, the person who raised that question. The second question that got raised was when this product is launched, if you are an existing Gibraltar Hub server user, will you get all this information for the data you have today, or will you only start with stuff that's new going forward? Here's the answer to that question. Um, if you are using a, a hub server with a SQL server back end, then since 3.0, it has actually been collecting all of this information all along. Remember, we've been working on this for a bit over a year, and so it actually has been collecting that data. There's just no way to surface that information until now. So if you're using SQL Server as of uh, uh, Server 3.0, it's actually been collecting all this information, and you're going to have it all going back to the beginning of when you deployed that, that version of the hub. Um, if you are using our software service system or you're using the embedded database version, um, then what will happen is only the, um, only the ones that, uh, only that it's still available on the server when you upgrade will be available. What we're going to do is requeue all the existing data to be reanalyzed automatically. So any data that's still on your server when that goes live will get pulled in. So depending on how much you keep on the server with, if you're using the embedded database, that may, uh, that may be a modest amount. Uh, for, on our hub service, it looks like it's going to be about a week, week to two weeks worth of data for a lot of folks um, that will pull in there. So there will be some data right off the bat if you're upgrading for, from an older release. Um, did someone just asked the question, uh, do we say it integrates with TFS? We actually have had customers integrate with TFS. We are not at this time pu publishing a built-in integration with TFS. Um, you want to talk to us about that. If you are really keen on TFS integration or JIRA integration or any other specific system, um, it is great to let us know that in the feedback on this talk or send an email to support because the order we make those type of, of integration modules is almost solely based on how many people request, uh, you know, and so that so we make sure we're doing the ones that that hit the most people. So, all right, that's so we've covered off what uh, product managers' experience is and the product developers' experience is, and we can see how you, know, you can drop in and and quickly get access to the information to solve to solve a problem. Um, but there's another whole angle here in a lot of teams, and this is really gets to that DevOps perspective, which is what if I'm on the support desk. Right, so I'm I, I, I'm providing support to customers, and a lot of times what will happen there is they might ask me one of two things. They might say, "Oh, uh, you know, we just had something that went wrong in production. You need to go fix it," and that's all I get. Or uh, there was something about a a timeout error in production, and that's all you get. And that's not a lot of information to go by. So, so how does Loop help in those kind of scenarios? Loop can uh, can really help you there. Um, as as you say, one of the uh, most frustrating thing about working on a on a, a support desk is you know you get the vague error message oh you know I I got I got some message about a timeout for example well you know some message isn't particularly isn't particularly helpful but on this theme um, that the dev guys um, had of kind of broadening the appeal of uh, loop out across the team um, we we now do have some help for the for the support guy you can see up here on the um, right hand side. And we have a a search box here. So what I can do is I can actually I can actually if I spell it right, of course that will help. Um, if I search for timeout, for example, then that's going to that's going to search across um, my particular application. Of course, if I use that from the from the dashboard, then it's going to search across um, everything globally. But since we're just inside the Acme software test application, it's only it's only testing within here. Uh, sorry, it's only searching within here. And now you can see, of course, that um, down here we've got um, all kinds of um, 
results, I just have to move the webinar bar because it's covering up my scroll bar. That's an awesome piece of um, UI and I can't actually move it. So, um, so <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, if I just click down here instead, there we go, it's moved off. Yeah, sorry about that. So, <clears throat> as we can see, we've got, um, we do have um, search results here coming from the log events where we've got seven matches here, the session events um, with the two matches, and I've drilled into these be before, so I, I don't want to to, um, to to waste time by doing that again. But most important um, in this particular scenario for the support person is we can see there are actually two matches in the issues. And if we look at this one, number 67, we can see that this issue has actually been resolved. So whilst we have um, the customer on the phone, we've typed in the kind of vague information that he's given us, and we've, we've found this particular resolved issue. So if we click in here, that will take us straight to um, the issue with the same kind of session events and statistics and everything like that that we had previously and um, all this good information that um, Loop provides that we can speak to the customer on the phone with and actually confirm that this is in fact the issue that he is seeing. At this point we can say, look, <clears throat> we have this fixed in this particular version here ending 319. Now, there could be an issue that uh, we as a company, we might not actually have released version 319 um, at, at this time, or we may well have released it, but the um, customer's tech team maybe haven't actually installed it on the machines. So whilst we have him on the phone, we're actually able to say to him, it's fixed in this version, this version is either coming um, in the near future, or we have shipped it, it's with your guys, they just haven't installed it yet. However, down here we can see, you know, there's um, there's a workaround down here, and if this is filled in, we can see, you know, um, there is actually a workaround for this particular issue. So not only can we tell the customer which version it's fixed in, and if we've not released it, when we're going to release it, but we can actually provide them with a workaround um, to use in the meantime, um, and that's all again information provided by a loop. Um, which basically helps your support guy get connected with the rest of the team. Um, apart from anything else, this whole ability to be able to look at exactly the same information as the rest of the guys in the team helps your support people um, feel part of the team and, and you don't necessarily feel that there's a dev team and there's a support team. Um, you know, it helps integrate them all into into one team when everybody can look at the same information. Not only that, of course, but the customer who's phoned up the support um, desk is getting, you know, first class, he's getting access to first class information. It's the same information that the developers are looking at and you're able to tell him in the, in the course of one phone call which version his particular issue is fixed in and you've been able to give him a nice little workaround um, to use whilst he's waiting for that version to actually be installed. So it uh, helps the support guys be a hero and um, um, enhance his reputation and the reputation of your company. So I also noticed on this, although you know we're not using this exact example, there's a notes tab where they can add additional comments and, uh, and this workaround you can, you, can, you can edit as well. Um, so again, it's, just, it's all this idea that I don't have to have a defect tracking system. I don't have to have everything a defect tracking system. But if we have one, then we'll be able to work with it. So it could be that, for example, the, the development team's defect tracking system may not be accessible to the whole company, but, but this is. And so they can go in and see this workaround information without having to have accounts in the defect tracking system, a, as an example. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, and also, as well, that it allows you to, to use Loop as perhaps a, a filter on your defect tracking system for um, something like your, your support guys. Um, if you've got a defect tracking system which has all of the um, munitia of all of the technical information, you don't necessarily need your support people to have all that information. And so you can use this as a kind of filter where you're saying, well, okay, I'll, I'll put in a few notes and I'll put in a workaround. I'll put in the information which is you know pertinent to the support team, but I don't have to bury them in all the technical details as well. So it's really up to you, um, I, I guess, as the product manager. Um, how you want to show that information uh, and how you want to actually make it available to each of the members of your team. Mm -hmm. Great, great. All right, so we've uh, we talked about the support engineers and their perspective on it. Um, 
Now, one whole angle of this, we've been dealing a lot with, with issues and chat problems and, and these type of events. Um, but I also noticed what we haven't dipped into is that little tab up there labeled usage. So I'm really curious to see yes. how that plays in. This really um, helps us bring the, the kind of this part of the webinar to a close with with it, with regards to scenarios, because what we're doing now is we're we're looping back full circle and we're going back to the product manager. Um, when we started the, this part um, of the scenario-based demonstrations, we started with the product manager from the point of view of he's responsible for quality, and um, we we showed how he would triage any issues that it, that he would have with his product out in the wild. But another one of the tasks that the product manager has to do is he really needs to have a, a, a future eye on where the application is going um, and what changes he's going to make. And he also wants to know what, what kind of um, usage he's, he's got here. Now, I just clicked on the usage tab here. So what I've actually got is the Acme software um, is the Acme software usage. And that's not really going to give us an awful lot of information. So what I'm going to do is pop back out to the dashboard. And I'm going to jump in here to um, Gibraltar Analyst with their um, 150 sessions and that's going to give us um, a lot better um, details. So I'll just jump in here and there you can see the graphs are, um, are, are far, more, far more interesting really. So if we, just, if we just pick one at random, so say um, endpoints by version, if we look at this graph, then what that is going to tell our product manager is um, on what day of the year um, how many people in general were using which versions of his software. So we can see by a country mile that this um, light blue color, the uh, 3.0.1 um, version is the most widely used out in the wild. Here we can see you know, there's roughly 18 people there. You can see there's figures changing. There's 14, there's um, 19, and there's 10. And you can see that um, you can see that changing over time. So we can see there where the 305 version comes out. We can see around about here, um, down this end, it's missing. But here, it's it's released. And you can see the number of people using these. So that's um, at a glance, you can actually see the, the um, numbers being used. Now, if I was to click, you can see that it's turned into a kind of link um, hand icon there. If I were to, to um, click this now, what would happen is down here in this area, you would get a list. Um, sh actually showing the individual machines that were um, using that particular version. Now, I'm not going to do that for the purposes of the webinar because obviously if I was to click here, you would actually see that information and, and people's individual machines could be identified from that. So um, I'm not actually going to show that out in the world, but you can, you can imagine a, a list. Imagine, if you will, um, a list here which shows, um, which shows the actual individual computers that were using that version. That's right, because this system we're demoing on right now, this is the uh, instance that we use to track some of the folks that are in our, basically our Gibraltar beta program. And so this would be, this is some re this is a subset of all the real world customers, but it would be their real machine name. So we obviously don't want to show that. But you, can, uh, but you can see, since it does actually reflect real world usage, you can see trends these people have of using the app. And you know, the lumps make sense, right? Because Analyst is used by people primarily on work days. So I guess it makes sense that you're going to have that classic week shaped hump. That's exactly the traffic. Can, yeah, and then you can see it tail off you know at the weekends and then and then up the up the week. But what but I like about this is the gas eventually. You know, yeah, you know, absolutely. <laughs> or they have no problems on the weekends. It could be that all the software works perfectly on weekends. That's the other it, possibility. Yeah, it's it's a bit like a tree in the woods. Fun. Yeah, it's like the tree it's like the tree in the woods. You know, if there's nobody there to uh, heat it, it doesn't make a noise when it falls. It's the same with software. At the weekend there's nobody there to see it. So it uh, it, it works perfectly. But I like the stacked nature of these um, graphs. You, know, you can see it in an absolute instant. Um, what is your most widely used version of your, um, of your actual application? And you can do the same kind of thing as well by, by looking at, um, at um, sessions by operating system, for example. You know, out there in the wild, you can see what operating systems are, are used. And again, um, at a glance, you can see what are the most um, widely used um, operating systems, like this nice spike when Windows 8 comes out. You know, that, this kind of um, this right before that, thing. someone really decided to get their Vista on. That's impressive. <laughs> they really did. They went. Oh, I would not have bet that mm, one. Thank you. <laughs> Somebody must do some regression testing. <laughs> yeah, it 
it could it could well have been some regression testing or something like that. Or uh, and there's a little bit of Vista um, over here as well. But you can use the the program manager can use this kind of information. Um, to see what kind of operating systems are being used and see what versions are being used and, and all the rest of it. And and if he's wanting to, he uses this information to make a judgment call about which direction to take um, the application in. Following on from that, actually, um, if you click down here on this minimum spec, then um, what, what we can do is um, we can start to look to see, well, what happens if I want to drop support for, for stuff? How many of my customers are going to be affected? Now again, I'm not actually going to run this because in the same way as with the graphs, down here you would get um, a, a list of actual uh, machine names and we don't want to show we don't want to show those. But here you can see, you know, what happens if um, I want to switch to 64-bit only. You know, if I hit 64-bit only and I hit the search, then down here I would see a list of all the non-compliant machines, and I can get a feel for, well, if I move to 64-bit only, I'm going to leave 50% of my customers behind, so perhaps let's not do that. Um, and obviously you can model other things as well, like, you know, the number of processors, you can model memory, um, screen resolution, the version of your software, how many people will get, will be effective affected if I decide to say, well, you know, I'm going to drop um, support for all versions other than the current one and the previous two. How many customers is that going to affect? Um, and that's really, really powerful information that Loop can provide to a product manager to help him make a decision about which direction to take the, um, the application. So with Loop, it's not all about defects necessarily. It's not all about problems. I mean, you can get really good information from Loop. Um, which will allow you to decide how you're actually going to progress your application in the future. So it's not all backwards looking um, history stuff. That's great. That's great. Thank you for that. So the um, so, so we've seen this usage information and uh, we didn't traipse through it, but uh, under the advanced filters, there's some really interesting options I know uh, for folks there. If you go back to the endpoints by version, one of the things that I loved the first time it was demoed for me was this idea of whether or not you're looking at all traffic or you just wanted to see, say, production usage. So for example, we go into advanced filters, we can select the option of that release type there and say, no, I only want to see uh, actual release versions considered, not uh, beta or internal. And yeah. uh, select that and close it and then it'll drop out the beta releases uh, any of the beta usage, which obviously it's good to be able to segregate that information without having to maintain two separate systems. Or uh, and it's it's really one of the design goals I know that there was for the platform of being able to let your your testers and your developers and your production environment all feeding into one common system. Yeah, absolutely. And another one, another powerful piece that that I like actually is this um, version by date. You know, I want to see. I, I actually only want to see versions between this one and this one and between this date and, and this date. You know, so you can really slice and dice the information that you've got in, a, in very powerful ways using these filters. Very cool, very cool. Okay, so we've, we've done a, a lap through the web UI and hit these scenarios for you know, product managers, developers, and support engineers um, and, and talked through that set of features. The, um, the other thing that I think we want to pop back to then is just to talk briefly about um, w with this, it seems like I could get going with Gibraltar really without practically installing anything, right? Because I could, I can get the agent right from NewGet.org and get that integrated in my application and then send this information to the server. Then as a team, we may not have to install anything. Is that, uh, how's that track for you guys? Yeah, I think that's um, that's that's absolutely right. I mean, once you've got it, once you've got the agents uh, up and running, it's a it's another one of these ideas that we want to um, broaden the appeal. And one of the other things that we want to do is, you know, we we want to we want to smooth out the speed bumps, um, as as it were. So now you don't really have to in, install anything. You know, you can just you can just hit it straight from from the web there. That's excellent. I think that's, you know, there's a lot of people that are going to like that because it's one of the reasons I think that we get into this mode where you have the logging guy, right? Is because at the end of the day, even though we, you know, as developers, we often have tons of stuff we have to install, you, nobody wants to install one more thing, right? I mean, after you've gotten your machine set up with Visual Studio and SQL and everything else, nobody wants to install one more thing. So the ability to do this all, you know, between NuGet and the web 
um, I think I think it is is really compelling. Yeah, I think well, it's I think it's um, re it's really powerful stuff. Um, but I I do know um, maybe it's time, Kendall, for us to um, for us to um, stop talking tech. Um, although we could we could talk about it all night because I do know that, that Rachel and, and Jay and other people in the marketing team are are going to want to know what what our customers think. And I and I think um, Rachel has a poll that she can she can pop up um, right now really to get um, the listeners' feedback on, on what they think is the most important things that we've um, shown today. Are you able to um, pop that up just now, Rachel? Um, Excellent. Now, of course, I'm on the um, presenter screen, so I can't so actually you can't see. see. But I can assure but you that I it's up and it looks great. That's fine. So all I get is a, all I get is a little notification that says I'm showing a poll at the moment, and I I'm, and I'm never 100 <laughs> percent convinced that it's doing it. But if uh, if you if you're telling me, then Kendall, then I'll I'll believe you. Yeah, all yeah. Open. You... All is open. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. That's great. While this polls up, I do want to um, uh, hit a couple of uh, things just to cover off some 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 of the business side of this. Um, so Loop is, you know, commercially, this is an upgrade for the uh, for Gibraltar, which means that if if you're currently a licensed user of the Gibraltar Hub or Gibraltar Analyst, then Loop is the next version for you. If you if you have a maintenance, uh, if you have active maintenance, you're going to get it for free. Um, it's part of just the, what you get for that maintenance, which is great. Um, if you are currently a subscriber for the Gibraltar Hub service, you're going to get upgraded to the uh, Loop service uh, at no additional cost when that ships. Um, so this is so this is great. You know, if if you're using the products today, this is just a good example of how the next version we're doing is going to add a lot of value uh, to what you're already doing. And in fact, the agents the same. The 3.0 agent um, that shipped uh, in 2012, uh, all the data it collects is what you need to feed this. So you can keep having those apps in the field collecting all that data. And it'll come right into this, and uh, you'll be able to see that much more and, and, and do that much more with it. Um, in terms of pricing, um, the, the pricing for the product's not changing from, from what's published on the website today. So if you want to um, you know, purchase a hub server license, that automatically, when Loop ships, becomes the Loop server. Um, the use, per user, we've always had this notion of per user pricing. It's always the way it's been. And those become users through the web app and the desktop client. There's no additional charge for you know to use one interface or the other. Uh, just user license covers both, and so you know by when you when you look at that pricing, you can see that uh, the user per user pricing is around two hundred and fifty dollars uh, per user. Um, it, on the software service side, that pricing is also the same. At uh, so you have a starting point of forty nine dollars a month, uh, and actually, what a lot of people don't know, if you buy a year, you actually pay for only ten months. That's four hundred ninety dollars a year. Uh, to include this capability, so that's it's really a good example of how if, if you've already been using Gibraltar, we're just making the experience that much better, and the pricing staying the same um, as as we go through this. So um, a lot of good stuff there, and um, uh, what we are currently doing, I mean, we're doing we have this webinar, we have another webinar we're going to do. Um, you, the preview version is available today. You could go out there today to the website and you could download the, the Loop previews. Um, that includes the server software and uh, the update, updated version of Analyst called Loop Desktop. That's available today. It's backwards compatible with um, with the agent. And um, the final version is going to be available in March. Now, we, we say this. The thing we're always looking for is we don't ship until we get the right feedback from folks that the products hit the mark, that the product is doing what people want it to do, what they expect it to do, that it functions you know, the, the way it really adds value. So there's always possibility that we're going to get some feedback during the beta program that says, hey, you really need to add X or Y, and we may add, we may hold the release for that, you know, delaying it minorly. But more likely what we will do if it's something that is we can't accomplish in a tweak or an adjustment is we'll go ahead and ship, and then we'll add that you know, right thereafter. Because we've got a whole team digging into these problems and digging into this UI to make it all happen. Um, and, and that's really it. So with that, um, let me ask if there's any last questions. If you, know, if you have a last question you want to pop into the list, by all means, please do. Um, and we will um, uh, go ahead and get that uh, addressed for you. Um, 
If not, if we didn't get your question, you can always at any time get, get, a, get a response by emailing support at gibraltarsoftware.com. Okay, that's great. If we finish talking about tech, um, which we could do all night, I think we'll hand over to Rachel now and she can um, tidy up our uh, webinar and, and rescue us and, and rescue these poor people so they don't have to listen to us talking anymore. Sounds good. Ah, sorry, it took me a while to get there. Um, thank you very much, Gary, Kendall, and everybody else that has managed to stay with us to the end of the webinar. Uh, I'm pleased to say that was quite a large number of you. Um, that's it for today's introduction to Loop. We want to thank you very much for joining us. And we hope that by this point you're now in a position to, to start getting started with the loop preview. So if you, as Kendall said, if you haven't already done so, you can download the preview from gibraltarsoftware.com forward slash loop. And I don't know if it's just my screen or if it's just in general, but I have a big black gap on my screen. Um, yeah, I see it too, Richard. <laughs> it's always good to know that the uh, technology is working. Excellent. Um, so if you haven't already downloaded the preview, go ahead and do that at gibraltarsoftware.com slash loop. And we'd also really appreciate it if you could share your first impressions with us as well. So whichever way you want to do that, probably by email since that's the only one that you can see. <laughs> <laughs> Support at gibraltarsoftware.com. Um, if you're already a customer, you might know that we have a live chat function that you can start via the website as well, um, or website as it says here. Um, if you head over to gibraltarsoftware.com and click start a live chat, um, you can chat directly with one of the team. Or if you fancy just getting social and you know doing the Facebook thing, you can find us at facebook.com slash gibraltarsoftware. So once again, Thank you very much for joining us on this webinar, and just to end on a super cheesy note, go on, go build yourself some rock-solid software.